Thank you so much for joining us today. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to the final episode of our online safety webinar series in collaboration with Google. I am Julian Kisau and I am an intern at the ASEAN Foundation. And today with us is my co-intern Bea Kampilen, who will be moderating the discussions with our panelists and of course our question and answer session. At this day and age of sophisticated technological advancements, the possibilities are limitless. The cyberspace is a wonderful place making information accessible, increasing interconnectivity as people are empowered to connect with those from different backgrounds across the world. However, with great power comes with great responsibilities and one of those responsibilities is safely navigating the internet. Every day, we are exposed to various online risks such as cyberbullying, misinformation, privacy breach, and online sexual exploitation. In this regard, the ASEAN Foundation, in collaboration with Google, launched the online safety webinar series for you. It aims to equip the youth with the necessary skills to use the internet wisely. This webinar series equips you to protect yourself from the perils of the online world and inspires you to teach your fellow youths on how to navigate the web safely and responsibly. This series was officially launched in November 2020 with a first episode entitled Digital Footprint and Cyberbullying. And then the second episode is entitled Misinformation, Don't Fall for Faith. For the third episode, it is Secure Your Secrets. And now, the ASEAN Foundation and Google is proud to deliver our final webinar which is titled Wellbeing. Parenting, Security, and Misinformation, which covers the whole theme from the previous webinars. The final webinar is also an opportunity for us to celebrate the 18th edition of Safer Internet Day with actions taking place right across the globe. With a theme once again of Together for a Better Internet, the day calls upon all stakeholders to join together to make the internet a safer and better place for all, especially for children and young people. Now, without further ado, to kick us off, we are pleased to have Dr. Yang Li Eng, the ASEAN Foundation's Executive Director, to deliver the first opening remarks. Please, Dr. Yang, the time is yours. Her Excellency Ko Li Peng, Ambassador of Singapore to ASEAN, Ms. Tenzi Norbu, Director of Government Affairs and Public Policy, Southeast Asia, Google APEC. Distinguished panelists, Ms. Irene J. Liu and Mr. Lujan Tio from Google APEC, youths and aspiring changemaker of ASEAN, ladies and gentlemen. A very good day to all of you. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the final episodes of the online safety webinar series for youth. Health in partnership with Google, we have launched this initiative last year with the purpose of equipping our youth with necessary knowledge to help them avoid getting into trouble online and practice safe and secure internet browsing. 
with lessons provided by online safety and news experts from Google APAC, as well as digital and communication specialists from UNESCO and Southeast Asia Freedom of Expression Network, SafeNet. This program allows our youth participants to discover and learn more about digital footprint, cyberbullying, misinformation, and how to secure their private data online. The webinar was re uh, received with great enthusiasm and we had an incredible number of nearly 200 participants attending in each episode of the webinar series. Today, in welcoming and celebrating the Safety Internet Day, Safer Internet Day 2021, we will have the pleasure to hold the fourth and final episodes of the webinar where we will deliver deeper into this topic. To allow more youth to learn how to serve the internet safely, I'm excited to announce that we will also launch the ASEAN Online Safety Academy website today, where we bring together all the lessons about online safety in one place. The website is free and can be accessed anytime and anywhere. Amidst COVID-19 and the Industrial Revolution 4.0, the internet becomes an indispensable technology in our daily life. The usage of the internet has vastly evolved from just a tool of communication and information into a daily necessity that opens the window for youth to continue learning and stay connected amidst COVID-19 lockdowns. By educating our youth about internet safety, I hope that they can unlock the great opportunities of the internet and be able to tackle cyber safety challenges. I'm also hopeful that our participants can become an active advocate of internet safety and promote smart and safe internet use to their community. Finally, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Google, our partner, for their wonderful support in making this important initiative a reality. To all participants, I wish you a very productive and exciting lessons ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yang, for your wonderful message. Next up, may I have the honor to invite Ms. Tenzin Narbu, Director of Government Affairs and Public Policy at Google Asia and the Pacific, to deliver the next remarks. Hello, everyone. I'm Tenzin Nobu, Director of Government Affairs and Public Policy for Southeast Asia at Google. Welcome to the fourth episode of our ASEAN Online Safety Academy, where we will cover the topic of well-being, digital parenting, and provide step-by-step -step tools that can keep you in control of your privacy and help you identify misinformation. Tomorrow, the 9th of February, marks Safer Internet Day. It is a worldwide event that raises awareness about online safety and encourages everyone to play their part in making the internet a better place. Google has a long-standing commitment to online safety, and we are a proud supporter of Safer Internet Day. Online safety education is important for everyone, starting in particular with young people. It is clearly a fundamental skill in navigating and responsibly enjoying the digital world, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, where people have come to rely even more so on technology. We recognize that without proper awareness, the increased time spent online can expose people to online risks, such as scams, phishing, and misinformation, to name just a few. That is why we run the ASEAN Online Safety Academy a webinar series on online safety that is designed to make sure everyone, particularly youth from ASEAN, can learn fundamental lessons about online safety and citizenship. Learn how to make smart uh, choices online and also access Google's safety resources and tools. Since November last year, we have organized three webinars and discussed issues related to digital footprints, cyberbullying, 
misinformation, privacy, and security. We are very glad to report that over a thousand youth across ASEAN participated in all three webinars, along with 80, 87,000 plus additional viewers across 10 countries. Today, I am really pleased to launch the homepage of the ASEAN Online Safety Academy that lists all previous webinars together with practical advice and guidance to help you stay safe online and get the most of your digital activities. This launch is just one outcome of our collaboration with our wonderful partner, the ASEAN Foundation. The ASEAN Foundation has worked very closely with us to help make the internet safer. I would like to also take this opportunity to express my special thanks to Her Excellency uh, Li Peng, Ambassador of Singapore to ASEAN, Her Excellency Kun Paspon Sangasubana, Ambassador of Thailand to ASEAN, His Excellency Tran Jok Bin, Ambassador of Vietnam to ASEAN, Deputy Secretary General for ASEAN Social Cult Cultural Community, Mr. Kung Fok, and all our partners for participating in and supporting this initiative. Last but not least, at Google, we are committed to making the internet a better, safer place for everyone. We believe that making technology for everyone means helping to protect everyone who uses it. We will continue to work together for a better internet. We hope this homepage can be used to educate more people on best practices for staying safe online. Thank you and happy Safer Internet Day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tenzin, for that very welcoming message. Up next is the remark from Her Excellency Ambassador Kok Li Peng, the permanent representative of the Republic of Singapore to ASEAN. Ambassador Kok Li Peng, the screen is yours. Welcome to the final webinar in this series on online safety. It is timely that we are wrapping up this series ahead of Safer Internet Day tomorrow, 9 February 2021. As a member of the ASEAN Foundation Board of Trustees, I would like to congratulate ASEAN Foundation for organizing this timely series of webinars and thank Google for partnering with the Foundation throughout. The internet is actually fairly young. The World Wide Web turned 30 in 2019. Older perhaps than some of you attending this seminar, but still relatively young in the broader context of human history. On its 30th anniversary, the World Wide Web's founder, Tim Berners-Lee, spoke to Time magazine about his revolutionary creation. He likened life on the web to be like life on the streets, some with some rough edges and also some smooth edges. I think many of us have enjoyed perks of the internet, such as being able to keep in touch with friends and family who are far away through emails, through social media, such as doing research without actually having to step into a physical library, such as buying everything online uh, from all over the world uh, through platforms like Shopee, Lazada, Amazon. But the internet can also be misused by people with ill intentions. For instance, the inaugural 2020 Child Online Safety Index report found that 60% of 8 to 12 year olds across 30 countries are exposed to cyber risks. 45% of this age group experienced cyberbullying, either as victims or as bullies. Online sexual exploitation of children has been on the rise too, complicating efforts by governments to stop this sordid tra trade and to achieve the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals pertinent to the protection of children. Singapore recognizes this as a serious issue. 
In 2012, we formed the Media Literacy Council, MLC, to spearhead public education on media literacy and cyber wellness, as well as to provide feedback to government policies on the internet and media. To spread its message widely, the MLC's Better Internet campaign engages social media influencers to produce videos, articles, and tip sheets on cyberbullying and online harassment. Our cybersecurity agency, CSA, works with the Ministry of Education to incorporate cybersecurity content for schools. Last year, CSA also collaborated with the Singapore Police Force to develop a handbook to help readers navigate the cyberspace, including ways to spot online scams. I am glad that ASEAN is also taking steps to help our communities navigate the web safely. In 2019, our leaders adopted a declaration on the protection of children from all forms of online exploitation and abuse in ASEAN. Last year, in February, ASEAN delegations gathered in Thailand for the first ASEAN Regional Conference on Child Online Protection, which exchanged ideas on good practices and solutions for protecting children online. I'm pleased that ASEAN Foundation, in partnership with Google, has launched an ASEAN Online Safety Academy homepage, which will provide youth in our region with learning materials on digital security. I, I urge you to avail yourself of this re resource. Spreading the word about safer internet access has become all the more important during this pandemic, where millions of new users have joined the internet and much of how we live work and play has gone digital. I hope this will be an enriching session for our youth to learn more about online safety. To borrow the tagline of Singapore's Better Internet Campaign, remember, be safe, be smart, and be kind. Good luck, all the best. Her Excellency. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we officially begin the webinar. In the next 50 minutes, distinguished panelists will discuss and give answers to different questions related to online safety that are submitted by our dear followers. As I have previously mentioned, this session will be moderated by Bea, which is also one of our communications intern. Ms. Bea, I would like to invite you to the screen. My name is Ani Nofia Regatia from Indonesia and I want to thank the ASEAN Foundation and Google for organizing the online safety webinar series for youth which is very useful for me and also for young people all over ASEAN because through this webinar we are learn more about the importance of online safety the importance of security especially when we are accessing the internet, social media and all form of online activities because this is very relevant to the condition of the world right now from many hawks from many dangerous activity we must learn to protect ourselves thank you thank you and thank you google and asian foundation thank you Greetings, my name is Bea Kampilan and I am an aspiring change maker just like you, as well as your moderator from the ASEAN Foundation for today's event. Thank you all for tuning in and I hope you are as eager as I am to hear from our speakers. We will now begin the presentation session for the fourth and final episode of our online safety webinar series for youth. Allow me to introduce our speakers, Ms. Irene J. Liu, the news lab lead at Google Asia Pacific, and Mr. Lucien Teo, the online safety education lead at Google APAC. 
Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Ms. Irene J. Liu, the News Lab Lead at Google Asia Pacific. Thanks so much, Bea. Why don't I start my presentation now and we will get going. All right. So everyone, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, really excited to talk about uh, a really important topic that is personally very near and de dear to my heart. And I think to all of us, um, so important, especially as we continue to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic and um, all the other issues that we face um, you know, in 2021, which surprisingly doesn't seem all that different from 2020 yet. But um, you know, today what I would like to talk about is top tips to verify mis- and disinformation. And so before I do that, I'd actually like to start with talking about sort of what my role is at Google and why exactly we are interested in dealing with mis- and disinformation. Broadly, Google's mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. And this is really important for us as a company and also um, part of our outreach is really related to how we can make sure that when people are looking for high quality information and they come to us, that they're actually able to get it. Um, the area that I specifically work in is a department called the Google News Lab. And we really, really focus on working with journalists across the world to help them to use technology to do better storytelling and um, enhance their reporting. And more and more, one of the things that journalists and news organizations need to deal with is how to counter misinformation, false information, and disinformation. And what we've done at the Google News Lab is since 2015, we've actually trained over 400,000 journalists in person around the world. And in ASEAN, we've trained 25,000 journalists in person. Misinformation is a really important part of that work. Um, I think that you know many of us probably never really heard the term misinformation till around 2016 when it became sort of a popular notion around the world. But you know this is something that actually we've been dealing with since the beginning of time. There have always been rumors. There have always been um, you know tall tales, things that people say, but they're not actually sure about. I think back in the day we used to call them urban myths. But now, more than ever, we have to worry about how to make sure that we can discern truth from fiction um, for in, in every format, whether we're talking about our conversations with our friends, um, in school, with our families, um, and on the content that we read online. So before I get started on specific tools and tips, um, I wanted to actually talk a little bit about sort of uh, a framework to really think about how to look at information and make sure that you're taking a skeptical eye towards it, right? Um, this is actually a wonderful resource from this news, uh, nonprofit organization called First Draft. And they really want you to think about sheep before you share. So really what they want you to do is before you share something with your friends on social media or elsewhere, um, start by looking at the source, trying to figure out where it actually comes from. Um, look at the history of whatever this piece of online content is um, to make sure that it is, you know, it comes from a, a reputable source and also whether um, that source is only always trying to promote one agenda versus another. Um, really look at the evidence behind a claim or a meme. I know memes are so fun and it's really nice to just kind of like share them because they can be funny or whatnot. But even funny satire that you know is not real if you share it, sometimes people will get tripped, right? Um, another really important thing is to think about the emotion. Um, is the source of whatever you're looking at using emotion to get you to feel a certain way or to make a certain point? Um, if it is triggering that heartstring or making you angry or making you want to feel sad or sympathetic, uh, really take a look at it and think critically about whether or not um, it's trying to manipulate you. And then lastly, pictures. Social media uh, is, is all about the photos now, and it is really, I mean, it really is worth a thousand words. Um, it can be really evocative. And so um, 
you know, and actually very easily manipulated. Any, any person with a smartphone basically and a free app can make a pretty good dupe of a photo. So really make sure you watch out. And so these are the sort of, this is the framework that we like to think about when you're looking at online misinformation. Now let's actually talk about the tools. So these are just a few Google tools that you can use in your day-to-day -day life to try to make sure that whatever you share is actually accurate. Um, to tell you the truth, this is um, an area of verification that um, you could actually spend days, months, years learning how to do verification. And actually, that's one of the things that we at the News Lab train other journalists on, and we have week-long seminars on this. So in just 10 minutes, I really can't talk about every single tool out there, but this is a place, really good place to start and super easy um, for you to just incorporate into your daily life. So the first thing that you wanna do is you can use search to find where the article comes from. Um, if, it's a, if it's a quote, if it's a meme, if it's, uh, you know, if, if, if it's a photo, which we'll talk about later, um, find out where it comes from and where else it's appeared. You know, all of us have gotten those, you know, messages for, according to a doctor from the World Health Organization, you need to do X, Y, and Z, right? Um, you know, take garlic, do, drink extra water, whatever, whatever. Um, it's really important to make sure that whatever you're looking at, if it says that it's from a source, double check that source. And it's super easy just by copying and pasting and going into Google search or another search engine. And you can quickly find out whether that doctor actually exists, whether they actually said what it's, you know, what it's claimed to be said. And um, very quickly from that, you can figure out if it looks sketchy, then don't share it. Um, but if it's actually from a reputable source, then maybe even better than just passing and forwarding on the text meme, send the actual article, right? Um, another thing that's really important is a lot of times in order to seem credible, when you get information, it'll actually be from a website that actually looks all right. I mean, you know, it, it's the thing about that's so tricky these days is that it's really easy to make a legitimate looking website. And a lot of people who are actually trying to trick others will actually take photographs and logos from other different organizations, news sources, legitimate newspapers, legitimate uh, TV stations, copy the look and feel of their website. But if you look really carefully at the URL, so the www part of the website, you'll actually see that maybe there's a misspelling or the logo has like a weird ending. Um, you know, the, the, the URL has a weird ending or something like that. So that can be a really good way to just check to see whether or not the URL and the article that you're looking at is actually what it purports to be. Um, it's, it's always a good idea, especially if you, if your, um, kind of instinct is that this maybe doesn't seem credible or this seems a little bit weird. There's something kind of off about whatever it is that you're looking at. Definitely double check the original website source and see whether or not the URL um, is, is legitimate or not. Another thing that you can do is cross-reference your news sources. This is super important because the truth of the matter is that with a lot of news, if one organization is reporting on it, others will also report on it too, especially when you're talking about important issues like health, um, you know, government announcements, um, you know, breaking news, things about floods or emergency disasters. Um, so really make sure that not only are you checking the original source of wherever you're looking, whatever you're looking at, but also seeing whether others have reported. Now, just because other news organizations haven't reported it doesn't mean that it's not true. It just means that it requires further investigation. And then another one, we talked about how images are so prevalent throughout social media now. It's the way that we like to communicate, um, you know, through memes and through photos um, to get people, and videos also, to get people to be really interested. It's just super engaging, right? Um, you know, it's, but it's really important to make sure that you check images and make sure that they're used in the right context. One of the most common ways that people are misled by images is that the photo itself is actually real. It actually hasn't been photoshopped or changed at all. But the problem is 
that the context, the text around it um, that is being sent is actually incorrect. So for example, you know, you'll, you'll get a photo from someone that says, hey, look at this, um, you know, this flood that's happening outside of my window right now. Um, and then it turns out that the actual photo is truly of a flood and it is a real photo, but it happened three years ago, not yesterday, right? So these are the kinds of things that you really should look out for. And so one of the things that you can really do quickly is you can use images.google.com to search by image. And what this does is if you, if you put in the URL of the photo you have, or if someone sent you the photo, you can actually upload the photo into images.google.com. And what it'll do is it will show you where else that photo has appeared. And so a really great example that we have here is, you know, this, uh, you know, social media post that said, um, this protester in Hong Kong returned tear gas with a tennis racket. And it actually even referenced Reuters as the source of the photo. So it looks quite legitimate. But in fact, when you do a reverse image search, what you find is that yes, this photo is from Reuters, which is a legitimate news organization, except that it was taken in France. If you look at the, if you look at the, um, the, 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 the caption, um, not in Hong Kong. So the photo itself is accurate, but the caption and the context is incorrect, right? So this is what you can do um, very quickly to just prevent yourself from sending something that is incorrect, right? Uh, and sometimes, in fact, the photo is manipulated. Sometimes it is photoshopped. Um, but if you actually put it through reverse image search, you may actually find the original photo from a more legitimate source, and you'll know that the other one that you received is photoshopped. Um, another thing that's really valuable to do, I think particularly as we're talking about um, you know, rumors and memes and kind of, um, you know, kind of the things that we, we get all the time on chat apps, especially from our aunties and uncles and sometimes parents and others, right? Um, is information about like, oh, if you do this, you won't get COVID. Or if you want to, um, you know, make a lot of money, you should do X, Y, and Z. Um, a lot of times, if it's a very popular meme that's being sent over and over and over again, legitimate, verifiable fact checkers and journalists will have actually already debunked that rumor. And so one of the ways that you can actually quickly look that up is to use the Fact Check Explorer, which is a database of fact checks from all over the world in multiple languages that you can use to search and see whether or not the thing that you are looking at has actually already been debunked by a legitimate fact checker. And so if you go to toolbox.google.com slash fact check explorer, you can actually um, use, do a text search and find out whether or not something that you've seen has actually been debunked already. If this is interesting to you, um, I would actually suggest that you spend more time learning about these tools. And actually at the Google News Initiative website, we actually have a training center it is focused for journalists, but actually anyone can use it. And the lessons are really quick, but really comprehensive to learn more about how you can use the tools that I just talked about for um, verification. We even have a specific course just on verification and you know debunking misinformation. And it's a really, really great one because it has some exercises, it lets you do it. And then also, as you do complete lessons, you get little badges and things like that, which is always fun. Uh, one other resource I wanted to mention is uh, First Draft. Um, if you remember the first slide that I had about not becoming a sheep and using the sheep framework to uh, identify misinformation, that actually comes from First Draft. They are a nonprofit organization that is really focused on fighting mis and disinformation all around the world. They have awesome, wonderful training webinars and um, it's a really great resource. This, um, not only is it targeted towards academics and journalists and fact checkers, uh, it's actually really meant to be a great resource for anyone. It even, they have um, webinars and resource guides on like how to talk to your family about misinformation um, and how to and how to debunk things um, in your own life. And really also about the psychology of why certain things go viral and others. So it's a really great resource and I really encourage you to, to check it out if you're interested in this space. Um, and then just another quick little uh, reference, there are a number of different fact-checking initiatives all around ASEAN. 
um, there, and actually this is just, this is not a full and comprehensive list, but this is some of the country-based fact-checking sites that you can actually resource. Um, some of these are run by journalists, some of them are led by governments um, or civil society. Um, so I would definitely encourage you to check um, these out. Many of these different sites actually have tip lines. So if you get something that you think should be debunked or you're not sure about the provenance of, you know, whether it's factual or not, you can actually send it in as a tip and find out um, from, and then the organization will actually try to debunk it for you. So really encourage you to take a look at these websites as well. And this is, I, you know, I would say, of course, I work most closely with journalists around the region, but the role of fighting misinformation is not just for professional fact checkers or, you know, news organizations or government or civil society. Everyone has to work together to do this. And the truth of the matter is that the most powerful thing that we can do as individuals is to help our own family and friends to fight misinformation and to not get tricked by rumors and others. And really the, the way we do that is by checking ourselves, making sure that whatever we share and whatever we look at is accurate, um, and also being comfortable having those conversations with those of our friends and family around us if they're sharing something that maybe isn't legitimate, that we feel like comfortable talking about it and having conversation with them about that. So with that, um, just another reminder, if you're interested in learning more about the Google tools, go to g.co slash news training. And, um, and I really hope that this is helpful, but you know, hope that also you'll take the time to dig into these tools and use them in your daily lives. It really doesn't take that long to fight misinformation. And um, the more we each do to do our part, uh, the better things will be. Thanks so much, everyone, for listening. And um, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Bea. Thank you so much, Miss Irene. That was a wonderful presentation. It was so well organized. And the tips were absolutely wonderful. Think sheep before you share. That's a very, very easy way to think about it. And I think I'm definitely going to take that with me. And also, the tools you gave, the websites, I, I didn't even know those existed. So thank you so much for sharing with all of us. Absolutely. Um, and I, I, I especially appreciate you mentioning that the role of fact checking, it falls on all of us. And I think we don't, te we tend to not realize how important it is to do that. And it's really important for all of us to come together and work towards this because it's something that affects us all. So thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. Um, at this time, I would like to invite our second speaker to our virtual stage. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Lucien Teo, the online safety education lead at Google APAC. Thank you very much for having me again. I mean, today I was supposed to speak on a number of topics. So I was supposed to cover parenting, security, and well-being. And I was wondering why these three were put together and specifically why I was supposed to talk to youths about parenting. And then when I thought back in, on my younger days, I realized that if you have a younger sibling or you have a niece or nephew or cousins who are younger than you, uh, and, and a lot of times in families, we play this kind of parenting role as well. We teach them how to use the internet, how to use the devices. And so this is a topic that is relevant, not only for parents, but for anybody who is a kind of a, an elder figure to a younger person. So we'll talk about some tools to make kind of doing all this easier. The first tool we do have is actually Family Link, which is entirely for free. And it's, it's, uh, it's, you can download it um, from the Play Store, but, I, but now it allows you many, many options on how you can kind of curate the, the experience that the child has. For example, you can guide them to good content. You do things like con set content restrictions. You know, you can approve or block certain apps that the child wants to download and install. You can view the time spent in apps. So I have three children. Um, my eldest is way past all this, so she has kind of more freedom. Uh, number two is stepping into his teens. So he used to have a lot of restrictions, but now we're kind of loosening them up as well but it's always good to monitor how much time they spend, what they spend it on. Not so much to kind of restrict them, but 
to, to kind of open conversations. Like if they're using a new app, you want to ask them about it. If they're playing a certain game a lot, you want to find out more about what the game is about, you know, and, and it helps families uh, connect on the digital usage front. You know, and you're also allowed to approve or block websites. We know that the web is a vast place. It has a lot of good information. It also has some bad information. And we want to make sure that at least for our children, they go to places that we approve of and we learn to block the ones that are bad. And the other thing is you can set filters not only uh, on the Android, just, just the experience, but also in Chrome and Search and YouTube Kids. Uh, it's all put in one place when you use Family Link. And then there's this favorite topic of parents all over the world, right? How much time should my child have? Is it one hour, two hours? So we did a survey recently, which we will reveal probably next week about parents' increased concern now that uh, COVID measures are in place and children are doing school online all the time, right? But screen time has always been something parents have been kind of obsessed about. And during this time where ev everything is done online, we found that parents have relaxed a little bit on screen time. Like it used to be 45 minutes. When I talk to parents, they're like, oh, 45 minutes is a lot. Maybe maybe let's do it 50 minutes. But now that schooling is online, parents are kind of just, oh, I don't know, maybe three hours, maybe four hours, you know? But nonetheless, whatever time restrictions you want to set, Family Link allows you to put that in, allows you to monitor how much time your child is spending on the device. Uh, this helps really, really a lot because we don't know. I mean, like, especially if it's a mobile device, your child just takes it, goes to a corner, and we don't know how much time they've spent on it the whole day. So it's always good to have some, some sort of way to track and also way to restrict it. And um, so this ability to lock your child's device remotely is probably the number one feature parents ask for. Now, I always caution parents, right? Before you do this, always talk to your child first. Like, like make this the last resort. Don't, don't do this up front. Because our parents come to me in workshops and they ask, no, Lucian, do you have an app with a big red button in the center? And I just need to hit that. And then my child's phone would die in his arms, right? And then I, I, I'll, win, I'll win the argument. I'll win the debate. There'll be no more arguments and because, because I win. And I always tell them that the relationship between the child and the parent, or even the child and the elder sibling, the relationship is the most important thing. And you want to preserve that, right? So, so even this locking the child's device remotely is something I would encourage parents to probably put it as a very last resort or not use it if you can, but it's there should you ever need it, right? And of course, on the flip side, you have the ability to grant bonus time. Like, like if your child finished their homework early, or they did something really good, they helped up the chores, and you want to give them some extra half an hour to play their games, this is a place you can do it as well. And I mentioned this in a previous training, but uh, this is, again, a useful tip. You know, today, I mean, our children, if they, if they go to school or they, they meet up with friends and they carry a, a device that they have on, on themselves, you know, you can track where they are. Family Link allows you to do that. This has been so useful because you don't have to kind of text them and call them and find out, oh, where are you right now? Do I pick you up now? Or immediately you know where they are. You know where they're waiting for you. You know if they're there. Um, what's interesting is this feature is also available in Google Maps. And I share this with my wife. So I used to travel a lot for work. And my wife would track me like all over the world and oh, no, where, where you are now. Not so much for the purpose of control, but just to know like, yeah, we, it, it's kind of like, oh, you're home or you're, you're, you're still out. Things like that help the family stay connected, even if we're physically apart. So Family Link has a ton of features. And if you'd like to find out more, it's google.com slash Family Link. Um, there'll be a number of resources there uh, as well. So one other thing we are doing, besides providing kind of the apps and tools for parents, is we're providing them a little bit of tips and tricks as well. And so we're creating a video series uh, called Internet Awesome Parents. And what we will have is we will have a series of a number of videos and we'll cover different topics each video, right? We talk, we talk about how parents need to approach these conversations that are normally tricky, especially when your child is um, especially curious. So with all of my three children, uh, I've tried restricting some of their online behavior. And I've noticed that even when you figure out how to speak to number one, 
child number two approaches it entirely differently, you know, and then you need to relearn these things. So even as we were developing the video series, it was a good refresher for me because every child is different and I needed different tactics for different, different children. So we talk about co-creating rules as a family, you know, what is acceptable. And I think above and beyond that, how parents are role models for the children's uh, digital use. So uh, I think this is also where uh, we can play the video and uh, we'll, we'll send the video over so you can edit it and, and insert it here. So kind of shifting gears into the security space, right? I mean, we've spent a few training sessions talking about how to keep yourself safe. You know, but at, once again, I want to point you back to the security checkup. That's g.co slash security checkup. And over here, you can see um, it's a very simple kind of step-by-step -step way to find out if your Google account is protected. You know, which devices access it, uh, where from, whether it's from the country you live in, or if you notice if somebody in another country is also accessing your account, it's all available here. You can lock those devices out of your account Know, and keep your account safe for yourself. And so that's where you can go uh, review results. The goal is to make everything green. I think, I think that's the gamification factor of it. Yeah, so just make sure that you do all the checks. Um, and then when they tell you to address certain points, yeah, just check and see that you know where your accounts are open and where they're locked. So we've been talking about two-step verification for a bit, right? I mean, we all know that most people, especially if you are new on the internet, you don't like turning on two-step verification because it's a hassle, right? I, it's already hard enough to remember that super long password. I'm keying it in and I, I just want to go to my site or go to my account. But two-step verification has proven to be really invaluable in preventing your accounts from being hacked. And also, I'm encouraging everybody to turn on two-step verification. And one thing I mentioned the last time was the SMS as a two-step verification. We've seen those kind of two-step authentications being compromised because SIM cards are being more easily cloned these days. You know, so we were talking about security keys, how you can buy a security key, use it as USB, but security keys are a little hard to come by. So what Google has done for Android phones is to have enabled all Android phones uh, using Android 7.0 and above to use your phone as a security key. So no longer does it send an SMS. Right? If you try to log in, let's say, on a PC to your Google account, and you've never logged in on this PC before, your phone will buzz just like this and asks you, and the phone will ask you, are you trying to log in? All you need to do is tap yes, and your phone will verify. Your phone acts now as the security key. So it no longer goes through the SIM card or SMS. And this is a lot more secure than the old way we used to do things. So those are the two tips I have just for security, but uh, there are tons more if you really want to be a security expert there are a lot of great material out there you can go take a look at. But uh, for, for now, it's turn on your two-step verification, take your security checkup. And one of the questions that uh, came up was this topic of wellness. So at Google, we talk a lot about how great technology should improve life, not distract from it, right? So during this, what, one year now of uh, COVID measures where we've all been at home, we haven't been able to meet our friends as freely as we'd like. Uh, I haven't stepped into a movie theater for a year, right? I, 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 I don't know what, what a movie theater is like anymore. Not, not like I went to a lot before this, but at least I had the choice. These days, it's like it's hard to, to, to kind of bring yourself to one. But technology should always improve life and not distract from it. So we watch things on our phones. We, we, we text people. Most of our, even right now, where I used to talk to you face to face, in a room, you know, we used to have these in-person events. Today, I have to speak to a camera, and I, I kind of connect with you through that, right? I'm, I'm very privileged in that we are able to do this, and we can bring people from all over the world into one common online space and share tips. But again, we shouldn't allow technology to take over our lives. So what we have done with Android is we have put in some features to allow you to track how much time you spend on your device where you spend it on. Are you watching too much videos? Are you on Reddit a little too much? All these things are all out there. And it's for you to find the balance in your life, right? A lot of people ask, like, how do I find this balance between tech and real life? I, I, I mean, to be frank, the answer differs from every individual because we all have different responsibilities around us. 
we all have different things we need to do. So like I said, I have three children. They take up most of the free time I have these days, you know, and whatever little time I have, you know, if I need to relax, I could possibly watch basketball on YouTube, stuff like that. But time time and again, I, I check like how much time I spend and it shocks me. Like, wow, I thought I'd, I wasn't watching that much, but I clocked three hours today. So it's, it's good to have some good data to find out if your habits are really where you think they are, or sometimes you're mistaken. So even if when you go on YouTube, YouTube is built in some tools as well. Like if you set a timer and you say, I, I, I want to remind me if I spend more than two hours a day, right? The reminder pop up, it's time to take a break. Maybe it's time to kind of get back to the real life stuff that you have to pay attention to. So at Google, we've been doing this for a while. Right? We allow you also to look at how much time you spend across and how whether you want to kind of you know, take steps to lower it. So a lot of people, when they're trying to get the grip on their own digital well-being, they, they, they are a little too ambitious in their goals. So for maybe four hours a day, they go like, okay, man, I'm going to do this. Tomorrow onwards, I'm going to just spend 30 minutes. And they realize it's impossible. But what you can do if you want to tighten down like the amount of time you spend on your digital device is kind of reduce it by a little bit. So data like this really helps. How much did you spend last week versus how much did you spend this week? And we know sleep is one of the things we compromise the most, right? So I know many people who sleep kind of uh, the last thing they see is their mobile phone or their iPad, and they fall asleep with the device next to them. You know, I always joke about how our generation has this scar on our face because uh, all of us would have dropped the device on our faces at some point in our lives, right? If you have a big scar, it's an iPad. If you have a small scar, it's probably just a mobile phone. But we've done this at some point or another. So what we've done with Android is you can specify the bit time you want, right? And to kind of ease you into it, we turn the, the display black and white, right? So it becomes less engaging, a little, a little bit more uh, subtle. And then you also know it's time to go to bed. So these are just some of the many, many features that were built into the Android, into YouTube to help you with your online well-being. So if you'd like to learn more, the site is wellbeing.google. And there are many tips uh, that all of us have kind of curated from, from kind of everybody at Google were just saying, we found this tip works. And we put them all together. It's available there. So if you have any that you want to add as well, feel free to drop us a line. I mean, yeah, just tell us what tip has worked for you. So anyway, with that, I end my presentation. So I will keep it short today because we'll head straight into Q&A. But I hand it back to Bea. So thank you very much. Greetings, everybody. My name is Lai, a participant from Cambodia. After attending the online safety webinar series for youth, I become more aware of my digital footprints and online safety. I got a chance to expand my knowledge on this matter, tips from the panelists on how to fairly manage my data privacy, and more importantly, helping elders staying safe online. As a student who is currently pursuing in this field of study myself, I cannot empathize enough that the lessons from all the sessions are truly relevant to the today's world. I am thankful to Asian Foundation and Google for making this series happen. Mr. Lucien, I, I really enjoyed your presentation. And I thought that your perspective on co-creating rules within your family, I thought that was really important because I, as a youth myself, I think that when you get to have that open dialogue with your parents, it makes you feel like, oh, they care about me. And this is really, they're not trying to control me. They're doing this to connect with me, to keep me safe. And I thought that was a really intriguing point for you to bring up. So thank you so much for that. You're most welcome. Uh, moving forward, we will now dive into our discussion segment with our speakers. Uh, the first question I have actually goes to Miss Irene. Um, what you talked a lot about what it, misinformation is, perhaps how we could caution ourselves from it. 
but what should we do when someone actually shares misinformation? What action should we take afterwards? How do we combat it once it's actually happened? That's such a good question. And I actually feel like, honestly, the tools and the skills are actually really easy to learn because you can control that yourself. And um, let me let me preface by with a little story from my own personal life about what not to do, which is that early on in COVID, uh, my parents were sending you know different videos and resources. And at one point, my dad sent me a video that was just saying all kinds of very very insane things about you know what you should do to prevent getting COVID, right? And I you know, went through and I looked at the source of the video and I looked at the speaker and uh, was like, you know, this university doesn't give out PhD. So he definitely didn't get a PhD from this place and da da da, da And you shouldn't send anything unless it's from a reputable source like the World Health Organization. I went on this whole rant. I think I was very tired that day. And then the message that I got back from my dad was, I'm sorry, I just sent it because I love you. And I wanna make sure that you're safe and i thought just in case it was right that you should see it and this is the thing is like so much of the time we like we people send things to us because they care and the view is just in case it's true i should send it no matter i should send it just in case right um, and so it comes from this like very loving place right so it becomes very awkward especially if it's your friends or loved ones to try to, you know, fact check them or debunk them. Right. Luckily, you know, my parents know that I'm a little bit of a know it all and will just go on rants anyway. So they forgave me, but it's not really the best way to go. I, th I think it's, but you know, the first place to start is to check yourself, right. Get the information, feel confident. Um, and then, you know, it, it's, it's actually very similar to what Lucian said, which is, you know, how do you have conversations on difficult topics with your family and with your friends? How can you gently suggest that maybe this isn't true? Um, you know, there, it, there are studies and there are tip lines and guidelines of how you can have these kinds of conversations um, with, with family and friends. Um, definitely recommend that, you know, you take a look at those resources. But I think really what it comes down to is just how can you best communicate with these people on a one-on-one, -on -one? treat people like, even though it's online, even though we're furiously using our thumbs and typing away, like how can we like just talk like human beings with each other about this stuff? And one thing that I found actually is, that is very helpful is if a third party has actually already debunked something, um, sending a, a third party link that's like, oh, hey, I came across this when I was looking, I, you know, I, I saw the video sent, um, I was really interested, so I came across this and um, here's another perspective or, you know, th th these guys are really, you know, they, they talk to a doctor about this, you know, that kind of thing. So it's you're, you're not really calling the, the person out personally. You're kind of subtly steering them to correct information. I think that's always a good thing to do. But honestly, this is the hardest part um, out of, of, of debunking misinformation. The tools and stuff are easy. This is the part that is, is really challenging. You could have saved so many of my relationships, Irene, if you told me this earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. It's we don't send these things to freak people out or we don't send these because we want to lie to you. We do this out of love and we care. And I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind, especially like you said, how when you react, your first visceral reaction is, ah, this is wrong. Da 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 da. But we do this because we care. And I think talking to people as humans, like you said, that's a really important point to take away from this. So thank you, Miss Irene. Um, the next question I have actually is very similar and it's for Mr. Lucien, because both of you had a lot of great points on what precautionary measures we should take, we should implement. But in the case that we face a privacy breach or someone is, there is a um, non-consensual dissemination of data that someone has already breached all the security measures that we put in place or perhaps we didn't put any in place because we weren't listening to this presentation what should we do in response to that moving forward the first thing you do is uh, on most platforms is a reporting feature and that's where you go first to tell them what happened 
take screenshots where you can. So you gather as much information or evidence as possible on what has happened and, and how you can verify that you're the owner of that account or the information that is there. And then you make the report and you support it the best you can. So one tip I tell people before, before they get hijacked or before, before they face any of this is set up the recovery email set. You know, you have multiple ways for the platform to get back to you to prove that you are who you are. Because if all they have is the password that now has been hijacked and changed, there's no way for the platform to verify your identity. Yeah, so I mean, it's kind of like, before you can do that, set up all your recovery email, phone numbers, you know, give them some other way to contact you. And then when you do get hijacked, report it immediately, send screenshots, tell them what happened, and try to get control of your account back. Thank you so much for that, Mr. Lucian. Uh, my my next question actually ties back a little bit, but I feel like both of you might have a perspective on this because, uh, for example, you've talked about how parents should be co-creating rules with their children, and we should be and children should be responding to their parents when they send us all this information as if as if we understand that they're coming from a place of love, but instead of thinking about what is the best way for parents to talk to their children about creating healthy digital habits, how can children perhaps approach parents when it comes to creating healthy digital habits as well? Because I feel like that inverse relationship is also really important. Um, That's a really tough question. Irene, go for it, please. I was, I was gonna say, I mean, I think, I mean, we all know those periods where we have to tell our parents to put their phones away when we're eating dinner, because now, and, and, I, and to be honest, I really think that the COVID-19 pandemic has actually changed how all of us engage with our dig digital devices and our digital life. Because when you're in lockdown and you can't see your friends, whether you're five, 13, 30, or, you know, 70, um, you're gonna, you know, if, if the device is the way that you can keep in touch with people, that's what you're gonna use, right? And so it, it, I, I definitely agree with you. I think that now, um, if anything, it's kind of leveled the playing field where it actually is a, it's a two-way conversation um, and the norms have really, really changed. I think that, um, you know, it's, it's not easy because obviously, you know, if you're a kid or you're a teenager, um, or even if you're, you know, an adult like me talking to your parents, um, it can be awkward to try to, I don't know, parent them or like, you know, give them guidance on these things or be like, you know, you spend a lot of time on your phone. Have you considered going out for a walk? You know, it's like it's, it, the rules are reversed, right? But, um, you know, I think that, again, it's very similar, right? I mean, in the same way that as young people, um, young people want to be respected and be heard and have their voices. And as parents, we have to, you know, we, sh we want to, we need to engage in that and um, treat them with the respect that they deserve. Um, I think we also just need to remind ourselves when we talk to our parents, um, even if you are still a kid or a teenager, um, you know, the, that, that you, you meet them from a place of respect as well. Mutual respect, I think will really go a long way. And, you know, I mean, I've, I've always been amazed at seeing, you know, especially now with remote learning, you have all these kids, who, like five-year-olds who know how to use Zoom and Google Meets and all these other things better than their parents. <laughs> and so the roles have really been reversed. So I think that, um, you know, these are all these lessons, the things that Lucien was talking about, they're, they're valid for everyone now. Um, they're really great. We, everyone should be using. So one of the things I do at uh, the workshop for parents, I, I, I used to run quite often was that I would be really hard on the parents because I could, right? Because I'm, I'm saying all the things that the children want to say, but they can't. So I, I always kind of place it back on the parent and myself, right? We are the role models our children will follow. We can set the rules, but if we don't follow the rules that we set, our children will never, never follow them. So one of the things that is still difficult for me is that I have all the charging stations in the living room and no phones are allowed in the bedrooms. But I find myself bringing stuff like in, because now my, my home office is at the corner of my bedroom. There's no way my devices aren't going to the bedroom, but it's difficult, right? So, so one of the things, parent to parent, we can encourage each other. We tell each other, come on, we need to do this for the kids. We need to set a good example. You know, we need to 
kind of work a little bit harder and putting the stuff away and spending time with them when they're young because these moments will pass. And so as parent to parent, we tell them that. For a child to a parent, that's a, that's a lot more difficult, especially in Asian families. That's, this is what I noticed. Like, I mean, I've met parents who go like, what kind of privacy are you talking about? As long as you live under my roof, there's no such thing. Right? And I've, I've seen this in, in many different countries, Indonesia, Philippines, every, every Asian country I've been to, same, same response. But at the same time, you understand that as a child grows up, the parenting style changes, right? particularly when they hit 12, 13, 14 years old, it starts pushing back. And I mean, right now, my, my second child is in that stage. And I'm learning that it's not easy to kind of flex, like, like, like evolve the parenting technique, right? But we need to give them space to make mistakes as well. So I, I mean, I would encourage parents once again, we're teaching our children not to just follow rules, but to have good habits and to make good decisions, which means we allow them to fail as well, right? So this is, this is kind of, uh, I can only encourage the parent, parent to parent, and then I'm always gonna be rooting for the kids, come on. You know, we, we can do this all together as, as a society. Yeah. Thank you very much, both of you, for your perspectives on that. My next question actually takes a little bit from both of your presentations. So if both of you have something to say, I would appreciate that too. But Miss Irene, in your presentation, you mentioned how it's all of our roles to combat this misinformation. We all should take responsibility for it. Um, but Mr. Lucian, you also mentioned that we should take time away from the internet and not oversaturate what we're taking in and really overload our senses. But how should we approach this balance between I want to make sure I'm helping and I'm doing good, but also taking care of myself and my well-being? How would either of you perhaps recommend that? Uh, I mean, the, the one thing I do tell young people that they have this heart and desire to do good, right? For the people around them, for the neighborhood, for the world. And so when you go online, there's so many causes that you could subscribe to. But I also remind them that clicking like or just subscribing doesn't do very much. And there are real needs around them in their families, in their neighborhoods that they could look at. And, and if you want real change, it takes real work. Right? It could mean like days, weeks, months of working at something to make something better for the, for the environment you're in, for the neighborhood you're in. So, I mean, I'm, I'm always kind of trying, trying to remind the young people that life isn't as easy as just clicking something and hoping it'll change. Yeah, Irene, over to you. Yeah, I think that one of the best words that's come out of, I don't know, 2020 or recently is doom scrolling, which is something that we all do right it's just that you know you <laughs> what no matter what your poison is whether it's you know twitter news um you know uh instagram facebook whatever 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 it is that you love to scroll it's like you could just keep going 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 and you know the truth of the matter is that you know there's there's a lot of bad news and a lot of you know things that as as lucien said that could be improved right <laughs> in the world and I think that it's one of the things that's really important is to realize, I mean, you know, what is that thing that they say every time you're on an airplane? It's like, um, you know, secure your own gas mask before your oxygen mask before you um, help someone else. And I think that that's really one of the key things that's really important to think about and learn is to be, take ownership of your own wellness and um, your own limits and realize that, you know, you, stop the doom scrolling every once in a while. If you're starting to feel kind of sad about whatever you're reading, just, you know, take a break. Um, you know, we can spend, you can spend all your time debunking every single thing that your every relative sends you. Um, but maybe that won't be good for your mental health or for your time. Right. <laughs> so, um, it's, you know, it's, it's just really, it's, it's just really important for each of us to more than ever take care of ourselves, think about how, what we do, um, what we read, when we read it um, affects us and and then, you know, pick our battles in terms of the things that we're trying to do. Um, maybe it's not the most important thing to, you know, fact check every single 
meme that is sent to you, right? But if it's a really important one and people seem to be really believing it, then maybe that's when you kind of jump in with a, with a, with a nice third party article from a reputable news source or something like that, right? Um, you know, but I, I, I hear your point. And I think that it, this is especially challenging for, you know, I mean, Gen Z, for young people, right? Because, um, you know, all these platforms are so native, it comes so easily, like you can just, you know, searching is not hard, nothing is nothing, none of this stuff is hard. Um, it's actually taking a break and stopping and making sure that checking in on yourself. That's that's the challenging part. Thank you very much, both of you. Uh, my next question actually goes to Mr. Lucian. Um, it's on the topic of privacy and security. So we talked a lot about how maybe we can take precautions about securing our data. But what about when we actually put information willingly out there, for example, on social media? Um, how can we ensure that the information um, that we have uploaded to the internet is safely stored or at least guarded with maximum privacy? So, I mean, we always talk about how you look for the platforms and the ones you use. Make sure you use reputable ones, right? Make sure that they have the security needed for the type of information you're storing. So what, one thing that we often do is we always look for which one is the most secure, but it depends on what you're storing. So if I'm just putting cat memes out there, it doesn't matter if it's secure or not. I mean, it's not, not worth that much even if you stole it and, and put your name on it. Right? But if I'm storing, let's say, my bank account, like all those details, I, I want security to be at a certain level. So make sure you choose platforms that provide the level of security for the type of information that you're storing. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that's kind of, I think, my, my easy way of uh, answering the question. Thank you very much. Um, I, I believe we have time for one last question. Um, let me see, sorry. Oh, um, this question also pertains to privacy and security. And it's one of the leading causes of cyberbullying is often the lack of a reporting system, um, so as Afra mentioned, as you mentioned earlier, that monitors the contents of comments or posts online. So given this, how would you advise that we proceed when surfing the internet? Actually, the truth is, I think there are often reporting systems in most platforms these days. It's just that cyberbullying, when it happens, it happens so quickly. By the time you report it, it's already happened. So I think that's more the issue these days. Right? One thing, I mean, we've been encouraging young people to do when they surf and they see this happening is to report early. That means if you see it happening and it's not to you, but to somebody else, report it anyway. Right? Stand up for the person being bullied. Don't just be a spectator and then just watch and like, like take out your popcorn and then just, just see like how this is unfold. You know, we need to be standing up for people who are being bullied because the real life implications and consequences of somebody being bullied, I mean, it plays out. It really affects somebody, right? So just make the report um, and then let's see if the platforms take action fast enough to either remove the offender or at least close down the interactions on the thread. Uh, those are things which platforms normally do. But yeah, feel free to report it quickly. The, the, the functions are normally there. Thank you very much. Um, for, I think this will be my last question for this segment and it actually goes to both of you because, um, and it you can each take it and apply it to the different presentations you've given. Um, so what lessons can we learn from the COVID-19 pandemic that is still ongoing actually that can help with either of the presentations you've given. So for example, what lessons have we learned regarding misinformation or what lessons have we learned regarding well-being and privacy and security from the COVID-19 pandemic that we can apply once hopefully everything is settled down? I'll jump in first. I mean, it's been a long year, right? With lots of change. And I've seen like two different responses to it, right? You have the people who can't wait for things to come back to what it used to be. And you have others who've seen, and this is a smaller group, who see like huge opportunity in how things have changed. So for example, I never thought I could speak to all of Southeast Asia in one sitting, 
but yet here we are, right? So there are many things we can do. So even when it pertains to well-being, it's kind of looking at how we use technology and knowing that there is the consumption habit where I'm just consuming and I'm, I'm not doing anything. And that's the creation habit where I'm doing something for somebody. I'm creating a video, I'm making something. And even my daughter was telling me when she creates something, it feels so much different from just consuming. And she actually loves making stuff these days, right? Online, using technology, you know, or putting stuff out there for kind of people to enjoy. And so I would encourage young people, pick up the skills, because even if we go back to the old days, these skills will stay with you forever, right? How to create stuff with technology, how to, how to do something good for people. And now you're able to do that for anyone, anywhere in the world at any time. So that is, that is really, really something that we can learn and take away. And I would say, you know, in terms of misinformation, information, and how we consume it, I think that the isolation that we've all faced as a result of COVID-19 um, and our changing knowledge of what is happening right in terms everything from um how is the virus spread um should i wear a mask or not wear a mask um what you know which vaccines are out have they been distributed is my school closed is it not like you know things change minute by minute second by second right and so um you know it's on the one hand you're just kind of inundated with information all the time and it can be really really daunting to try to figure out what is true in this moment because actually what is true in this moment may not actually have been what was reported previously from even reputable sources, right? So it can be very daunting to try to keep up with everything on the one hand. And on the other hand, you know, this isolation has made it so that, um, you know, we are relying more and more on the sharing and distribution of information um, remotely. And, and it takes away some of the humanity of the way that we all interact with each other, right? And and that's and that's really tough. Um, and so I think that you know, really, it's for for me. I think one of the things that I've really tried to emphasize in in my own life, and also it, when talking to journalists and others, is like, you know, we need to. It, we're limited in the ways that uh, we can share information and show compassion and show empathy, right? Um, but we still we can't just pretend like well, that doesn't matter right now, or, oh, well, let's wash our hands and not worry about that. It's like, how can we make sure that what we share, um, how we talk to each other, how to communicate, um, still is putting a human first? Um, and, and, and also how can we, again, take control over our lives and our wellness, stop the doom scrolling and, you know, find coping mechanisms to, get the information we need that is so important um, you know for our health for our family's health and for our life and wellness um, but also balance that with you know just be get staying sane um, until things change right and so uh, I think that that's one of the things that's going to be really different and hopefully the lessons that we learn of how we do this through digital electronic communications will be lessons that we can take away even when we can start traveling again and meeting people and and having conversations in person and all that kind of stuff right that um you know we'll still keep those best practices in mind um you know going into the future and i think that lucian i mean i completely agree with him it's like what we've lost in terms of that person-to-person -person contact um we've gained in being able to kind of reach even more people in one go right um which is something i think will continue um even after all of our you know, after everyone has been vaccinated and we can all start gathering again together in person, right? Um, you know, so hopefully, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll gain more than, than we've lost um, in over the next like year or two. Thank you, both of you. Thank you to both of our speakers. I greatly appreciate your contributions and I have enjoyed this, this discussion. Um, it is now time for us to close the session and I would like to provide each of you with the opportunity to give a brief closing statement. Uh, Miss Irene, the floor is yours. Uh, I mean, we've talked about so many things. I don't, I feel like, you know, we've pretty much covered it. All I would say is, um, you know, check what you, what you receive, um, 
be nice when you're fact checking your family and friends um, and, uh, and, and, and take care of yourself. That would be what I would say. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Irene. Uh, next, I would like to invite Mr. Lucien to give his closing remarks. I mean, I've had the privilege to meet many of you uh, month after month for a while now. And I mean, it's, it's amazing to see the energy we have here in Southeast Asia, especially among the young people. You know, and I was very encouraged because uh, when we first started this, I was feeling a bit down, like not being able to meet people, but seeing all the faces and all that really helped. And to know that the future of Southeast Asia is in the hands of this generation is something that's, that is encouraging. You know, to know that so many young people care, are willing to learn, willing to put time and effort to make their communities better. You know, so I mean, I'd encourage, again, like what, what Irene shared, right? I mean, if you're, if you're spent all your life just scrolling, you never get out there to do something. Yeah, so sometimes get out there and make life better for the person just next to you. And if everybody does that, I mean, I think the world is going to change. So yeah, keep up the good work. Thank you, Mr. Lucien. To both, of my, to both of our speakers, I would like to extend my sincere thanks for sharing your earlier presentations and your perspectives during the discussion. With that, I will now conclude this segment and hand over the proceedings back to my colleague, Julianne. It's Jan Opestal from the province of La Unión in the Philippines, and I work as a teacher in a small private school in the said province. What online safety webinar series for you taught me in these three webinars are it gives me an idea of how to safely secure the digital footprints in the cyber world and also to avoid cases of cyber bullying in the use of online learning modality, a working philosophy and understanding analyzing information to identify fake and misinformation, and above all to privately secure accounts against hackers. These lessons are relevant today because it gives someone a head start to, on how to secure and safely browse information for their learning and understanding. Thank you ASEAN New Foundation and the entire ASEAN Union and hoping for another kind of webinar. That's enough screen time for today, Jake. Mom, you always say that. Google presents Internet Awesome Parents, your kids and their online behavior. The Internet is a wonderful place for kids to learn and enjoy. But with time spent online going up, we need to talk to them about their online safety and well-being. Here's how we can step in without overstepping. First, we have to understand their world. Unlike us, our kids have never known a time without the Internet. It's natural for them to go online for everything, be it learning or fun. As parents, we need to empathize with their instincts. Next, get to know their interests and find ways to be genuinely present. Yay! And together, you can discover other wholesome content and help them understand what's appropriate. That's cool! Then, create the rules together and listen to their point of view. These are great ways to start talking to your kids about their online safety and well-being. Wow, Jake, we're getting good. Whoop, whoop. Now that you're set to learn more, catch all six videos on Internet Awesome Parents for a little help with digital parenting. Thank you so much to our dear panelists for that very insightful discussion. I would also like to extend my gratitude to my lovely colleague Bea for moderating the session. Ladies and gentlemen, as we have reached the end of today's webinar, please allow us to send our deepest appreciation to everyone for giving us your undivided attention. We would like to express our sincerest gratitude for the enormous support that we have received from our partner Google for making this webinar possible. If you want to watch this webinar again and want to equip yourself on how to navigate to online safety, please visit our ASEAN Online Safety Academy website that just launched today. Until then, please stay safe and have a great day.